This is Leading with Power. Today, we're excited to have you all join us. And uh, to begin our session today, we'd like to welcome everybody from La Crosse, Madison, and Wausau, and all over the country through our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button below uh, to get constant contact content coming into you uh, from our YouTube channel. Uh, we're going to begin this morning with a poll. I guess you could say this noon, I'm going to launch a poll. We have three questions for you to get started, kind of set your mind on uh, what we're going to be talking about, uh, things that lead you from uh, imprisonment to uh, being pardoned to having purpose in your life. That's our topic for today. So uh, what imprisons or limits you is the first question. If you would, please answer that from the list of options. The second question is, are you finding God's help in your limitations or circumstances? And the last is, please rate yourself uh, on a sense of purposefulness in your life. Uh, so right now, about 10% of you have voted. Uh, continue to put your votes in. Uh, we would really appreciate it. Today, uh, we have Jeff Jackson with us. Uh, Jeff is going to be talking about aspects of his journey from prison to pardon to purpose. After serving a three-year sentence for armed robbery, Jeff went on to become a physician's assistant, acquire a full pardon, and navigate through many challenges towards purposeful living. As part of that new purpose in life, Jeff has founded a youth ranch just south of Eau Claire called Acres for Joy. Here's uh, Jeff on his Clyde Clydesdale Maggie. That's Jeff on his Clydesdale Maggie, and that's his daughter, Sarah, on the horse Memphis behind him. Just part of what happens on his youth ranch just south of Eau Claire. So without further ado, men of Leading with Power, please welcome Jeff Jackson. Jeff. Okay, well, thank you. Well, thank you. Well, good afternoon. I am, uh, I'm Jeff Jackson, um, and I live just south of, uh, south of Eau Claire. I'm a, I'm a father, I'm a grandfather. Um, I'm, I've been a physician assistant for the last uh, 34 years. Uh, I'm a co-founder of uh, Acres for Joy, which later on I'd like to be able to uh, speak a little bit more with you about. Uh, and I am uh, grateful. I'm, I'm grateful for, for many things you're gonna hear. Uh, you're gonna hear about that as we go. Um, at the age of 13, uh, I heard the gospel for the first time. Um, I was being raised in a single parent family. I had a lot of energy and um, uh, I, uh, someone spoke to me about the love of Jesus Christ. And, and two weeks after I heard that message for the first time, uh, I, I believed it. I, I believed that I, was, that I was known, that I was loved, and that I was longed for. And, and I responded. And in that response of simple childlike faith, um, I became a Christian. And, and for a time that occupied me, it occupied my thoughts and my mind. And, and, but as just a, a few years went by, that became less and less a, a central part of my life. And I was on to uh, all kinds of energy and youth. Well, at, at age 19, I, I committed an armed robbery. It was, uh, it was an intent to get money to, to buy drugs. And I, I held up a, a liquor store um, and I, I was caught, I was caught later that night, uh, and, um, ultimately was, was, uh, given three years, uh, three years in prison. And I, as I entered prison, I, I'll tell you, it was a, a, a frightening time. Think of a young man. I had no previous uh, legal history. My family, you know, this was very much out of character for where I'd come from. And, uh, and I began serving that time. And during that time, I, I once again repented because I remembered, I remembered the, the, the story of the prodigal son that I'd heard when I was, was 13. And, and I remembered that I was known, uh, loved and longed for, and, and that I had, that I had uh, you know, definitely made some choices going a different direction. At age 22, I was, I was released from prison and I began to falter again. My faith began to falter as I got back out and by the kindness of God, uh, a young woman invited me uh, to a simple house church. And uh, it was there that I once again heard that message that I'm known, 
that I'm cared for, that there's a purpose for my life. And, and that was a lot of complications. I had a lot of guilt for what I had done and then, and then for going wayward again. Um, but I, I recommitted myself to Christ at, at that time, age 22. And within a few years, I had completed uh, a, a registered nurse program. That's a whole story in itself. And, and after that, I applied and, and was accepted to physician assistant program and, and completed the PA program. Uh, I took employment and, and a couple of years later, I applied uh, to the um, pardon board seeking a pardon. And the, the crime had occurred in, in Nebraska. And I, I'm from Wisconsin. I'd gone, to, I'd gone to Wisconsin or I'd gone to Nebraska and the day after I got there, did this robbery. And then that led to incarceration and I was in prison, jail and then prison. And, and when I got out, I stayed down there. And, and um, I applied to the pardon and presented before the pardon board. And my, my intent was I had really screwed up as a young man. And I saw that, I knew that, I had repented of that. I wanted to get free I wanted to get free from that guilt and that weight in every possible way. And so as I came through college and learned of the possibility of a, of a pardon, I, I pursued that. And, um, and Governor Kay Orr was the chairman of that pardon board. And she listened to my story. And, uh, and by the end of it, uh, they granted me a full pardon with restoration of gun rights. And you know, and if you're a felon, um, you you can appreciate that the presence of a pardon is a is a very significant thing, and that the restoration of gun rights uh, for an armed robber is a very significant thing. And I I left that courtroom remarkably grateful. I want to I want to read to you just a a couple of phrases from the pardon itself, and I want to I want to draw our attention to the purpose of the pardon, okay? So the pardon says that whereas the, the pardon board did consider uh, Jeff Jackson's uh, application and found him a subject for clemency, that the, that the common good would be served. And it went on to say, and these are the words within the pardon, it went on to say that as an act of grace, they granted a full pardon, freely and unconditionally absolving me from all legal consequences related to that offense. And that in that matter, I was forgiven and the consequences remitted. And as a Christian, when I, when I saw that legal phrase and that, that conversation about how they believed that the common good would be helped if, if that baggage left me, if I was able to put that fully in the back. And that as an act of grace, they forgave me. And it was, it was the offering of clemency. Well, you can appreciate as a, as a believer that I, those, those words greatly resonated with me. Now, within the pardon is the statement that Part of the reason why they're doing this is that they believed that the common good would benefit. And friends, that's exactly what happened. And I, I shared with you at the beginning that I, I am a grateful man. I live gratefully. And, and um, there's so many, so many reasons for that. But one of them is that the Nebraska Pardon Board gave me this pardon and thereby released me from so many consequences and from the guilt and the shame and the burden of that, of that which I was fully and completely guilty of. And from that point, and that occurred in 1987, and from that point, I've had no further legal consequences. I've gone on to serve, I've gone on to raise a family. I'm the father of four uh, wonderful girls. I have six grandchildren, and I've gone on to serve as a physician assistant uh, for 34 years. Um, for the last 25 of those years, I, I serve in behavioral health. I, I work with those who, who struggle with mood and emotion and, and mind 
uh, troublings, you might say. I'm so grateful, so grateful for that pardon, so grateful for that release and that new beginning that was offered. Now, you've heard that I'm the co-founder of Acres for Joy, a nonprofit organization with a clear intention to serve youth and to help youth, youth that are troubled, youth that are, are burdened uh, beyond their, their age. Well, the way I got there, my friends, is my, my second daughter, my beloved daughter, Abigail Joy, struggled, and she struggled uh, with physical and mental health concerns. And that struggle led me to, to buy a field with the intent of getting horses and trying to change her environment and help. And, and it looked like the good hand of God was upon us as doors were opening and, and things were coming together. But that suddenly changed on September 11th of 2005, uh, when at the age of 18, my beloved Abby, our beloved Abby, passed away unexpectedly. And uh, it, it, threw a, it threw a challenge. It, it, well, I can't even put it into words what followed. But believing that the Lord was opening doors and then suddenly this, this cataclysmic redirecting and the absence of Abby. But in that, I have found purpose and direction. I have found a calling to serve and, and to give to those who have need. And, and my life is full of active service, both with my profession and mental health and, and hands-on. You know, yesterday I hosted 30 kids on this ranch. To be in our program, you've got to be failing. To stay in our program, you've got to be raising your head and moving forward. And all of that adds to a sense of gratitude and gratefulness. Because I look back and, and time and again, especially in my practice, I, I see young men that I, I see myself in, uh, those, those captured by, by substance uh, abuse, uh, those discouraged and, and lacking direction and lacking purpose. And, and, and I see myself there. And time and again, I reflect upon the kindness and goodness of God of how he, he intervened in my situation. He had mercy upon me and I, I'm so grateful for that and I'm so grateful that, that I responded to that invitation. And as I've already said, I'm grateful for the process. You know, the second best thing that ever happened to me, the second best thing that ever happened to me is that I went to prison because, because in prison I was interrupted and I faced the reality of a pathway that was, that was not healthy, not good and not gonna end well. The first best thing that ever happened to me, when I was 13 years old, I heard the gospel and I accepted Jesus Christ in all simplicity. I mean, what, what did I know at 13? But I knew that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And I, and I believe that that, that that love reached even me and, and therein, um, therein I became a Christian. Now, as I've shared with you, after, thereafter I floundered, and I floundered in many a way, and I have floundered in different ways throughout my life. There's no doubt. But what you're going to hear today from me is that time and again, in narrow places, in lonely places, in long, isolated corridors, I found the help of God. You see, Lincoln, Nebraska was the only physical prison that I was in. But I, I have been in many narrow places, confining places, imprisoning places. I've held perspectives within the Christian world, perspective of, of exclusivism. I came into a group that, that had such a remarkably narrow view of things that we were essentially the only ones, right? I, I tell you, tremendously limiting. I've been in the long corridor of, of depression and loneliness with the death of my daughter and other, other challenges along the way. And friends, like, like all of us, we have things that draw our attention and seek to keep our focus and distract us from, distract us from the things that matter the most and distract us from, from giving, giving effort and diligence and pursuit of, of that which we're called to. So, while this, what, 
what I think in part attracted you is in reference to me, prison and pardon and purpose. I want to, I see a parallel with all of us. I see a parallel with we and you. Because friends, most likely you've not been incarcerated in a, in a firm prison. But the questions that we put before you, the questions that I bring, is that there are many kinds of imprisonments, many kinds of limitations. And of course, the, the greatest of which is, is having a life distanced from God. But even, even knowing him, there's, there's the, uh, the challenges of discouragement and of guilt, of addiction, things that, that occupy us. Friends, I, I want to suggest that um, I, I would ask you to look closely at your life, at your situation, and, and give consideration to where you are being confined and narrowed and limited. And one of the things that happens, you know, in the book of Proverbs, it says that the righteous are bold as lions. And one of the things that happens with, with guilt uh, is that we lose our boldness. We lose our confidence. We lose, we lose our joy. And, and I represent that here as different prisons that we all encounter. If I could, Jeff, at this time, um, it's a great point to interject uh, the results of the polling that we okay. sent out earlier. The first question is, what imprisons or limits you? And uh, the biggest answer was 51% distracted from things that matter most. Hmm. That's what limits or, or imprisons you. We'll come back to that in just a second. The second thing, are you finding God's help in your limitations or circumstances? 56% of you said increasingly, and 41% of you said consistently. So way more than half are, are well on their way towards finding God's help in your limitations and in your circumstances. And number three, on a scale of one to five, please rate your sense of purposefulness in life. One is not full of purpose or discouraged and five is enjoying each day with gratitude and really nobody uh really was in that lower category and uh in number uh everybody right above that one third was surviving it with a number three one third was number four and and the balance was one third was number five enjoying each day with gratitude so i have to say that everybody here is really uh, in that, I'm sharing the results uh, right now of that poll. And as we share that, I just wanted to say, uh, Jeff, that uh, a verse that's really um, connected with me is in Galatians uh, 5, verse 13, it says, freedom means that we become so completely free of self-indulgence that we become servants of one another, expressing love in all we do. And I think that first question, you know, what limits you distracted from the most thing, things that matter most is that freedom in Christ means that we can become completely free of, of self-indulgence that, you know, living as a living sacrifice before him. So with that, Jeff, uh, I'll end the polling and uh, hand it back over to you. Well, okay, well, thank you. And thank you. And then, you know, as I think about the audience, as I, as I, given consideration to this i'm i'm mindful that there's there's such a spectrum of people who'll be listening and and for some there's a call there's a call to original opportunity with the lord and and for many hopefully there's an encouragement and that that we we are encouraged by one another's faith and i'm, I'm encouraged by the the number of people who are on the upward way um, in the midst here and as i turn to pardon so i've spoken here about um prisons that we all encounter I want to speak for a minute. I want to talk about pardons, the intention. And of course, the pardon from, uh, you know, let me begin with this. In, in Luke 4, the Lord Jesus quoted a, a verse out of Isaiah, where he said that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden. Friends, we know that he came amongst us and, and he went about doing good and healing and helping and encountering individuals in their unique and specific circumstance. 
and we know that people were changed. The gospel is, is rich, and the book of Acts is, is rich with stories of individual personal encounters where, where people met him, heard of him, met him, were affected by him, and their lives, their lives were changed. And friends, I, he has come for each one of us. He has come for all of us collectively, but he has come for each one of us individually. And whereas, as we know, whereas Christianity is in a large part lived out in, in community and with others, it is originated and maintained in private with him. It is lived out in a public arena, but it begins with my hearing his voice and my knowing him and my my knowing that he is there for my situation and my circumstance and and that my burden and my guilt that those that 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 load so i'll tell you what so often so often we hear this faint voice in the back of our head that it's it doesn't apply to me it applies to them or it applies to them but it wasn't me he can't help me and that's just simply not not the case you know, I think uh, I think of I think of individuals who are are heavy and guilty and limited. I tell you the, the weight of that heaviness and, and guilt, what it what it does over time. And I think of uh, of some who might say that the hour is so late, so much has passed. You just you don't know. You don't know what I've what I've been through, or you don't know what I've done, or or so many opportunities have gone by. And as I reflect upon that, I, 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 I remember and I, I'm, I'm so encouraged that as the Lord Jesus, as the Lord Jesus was taken to Calvary, he was with two criminals. He was with two thieves. And in one, one gospel, we're told that both of them were hurling accusations against them, against him. We're told it's in Matthew that it says that both of them were, were speaking ill. But in Luke, it says that as one of them hurled accusations, the other said, don't you recognize that this is, uh, uh, that this is the son of God? And, 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 and that, that criminal, that thief, that who was being crucified by his side, said to him, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the Lord Jesus said, today you shall be with me in paradise. And friends, I, I love that passage. Because that is a passage that has been given to us to remind us that no matter the lateness of the hour, no matter the lateness of the hour, yes, so much potentially has been lost. But friends, what is to be gained from this moment forward is so great. You know, he encountered, individ he encountered people individually and they, he, they received him and their lives were changed. And, and, and they changed occupations and, and they redirected their life and they began to give full hearted um, focus to Jesus Christ. And some of them, as we know, how about, how about the book of John at the end where, where John said, so many things that he has done cannot be written, but these have been written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Or how about, how about Peter, when he said to us that we have been giving, given exceeding great and precious promises by them that we might become partakers of the divine nature? How about, I believe it was Jeremiah who said, thy word was found and I did eat them and, they came, and, and thy word became to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. How about the Lord Jesus when he said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Or if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And my, my repeating these verses is, is to share with you that those who were near to him, that those who, who know him best, that they were so affected and so changed, that they so committed themselves and invested themselves in communicating to others the truth that they knew. The absolute truth that they knew. And how about the Apostle Paul who said, whatever things were gained to me, I, I count as loss as he, 
as he pursues, as he pursues Jesus Christ. All right, I want to remind you of a hymn. And there's so many rich, rich hymns that that uh, call us and remind us and encourage us. But one there is above all others, well deserves the name of friend. His is love beyond a brother's, costly free and knows no end. They who once his kindness prove, find it everlasting love. Which of all our friends to save us could or would have shed their blood? Christ, the Savior, died to have us reconciled in him to God. This is boundless love indeed. Jesus is a friend in need. Now, my invitation to each one of us is to continue to kindle afresh our response to his invitation an initial response, if we don't, if we're not Christians, if we don't know him, that we might, that we might turn our, our heart and our, our mind and our affection to him and receive, receive the gift of his grace. You know, um, but for those of us who are believers, friends, mindful that God's intention, he brought us out that he might bring us in. His intention, uh, let, me, let me look at this from, I'll, I'll look down because I've got a, a Bible here in front of me. But how about Titus? who encouraged us to be looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here it is. Who gave himself for us, that he might purify, that he, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. Here it is. And purify a people zealous for good works. Friends, he has laid hold upon us that, that, that he might work within us and use us and that he might that we might be freed from our prisons, that we might be finding our, and I would say our and you, that you might be finding your pardons originally and for all the other uh, narrow corridors we end up in with an absolute clear intention that we might be living purposeful lives. And, and I have shared with you that south of Eau Claire, well, in Eau Claire for my medical, my medical practice and then south of Eau Claire on this youth ranch, I. By the kindness and grace of God, I'm, I'm engaged in, in purposeful relationships and making a difference. And that's just the sphere where I've been planted. And I know that every one of us have been planted in a, a unique sphere. We have been planted that we, might, that we might be conduits and channels, that we might be illuminaries, that we might be those who in, in the privacy of our relationship with Jesus Christ and with God, that that, that we hear a calling, that we, we have a vision, that light affects us, and that we go out. And, you know, how does that practically look? Well, that we need the Lord for, right? I mean, it's going to look like relationships and, and connections in our family and our workplace and how we carry ourselves and the things that occupy us. Um, you know, I want to share one, one, other, one other thought. Uh, and I meant probably to share it a little bit earlier, but there's a quote that I, I remarkably like that is, let us never believe that our past is only a prophecy of our future. For with many, the very memory of the past is discouraging and paralyzing. Our past is not a prophecy of our future. Friends, we need to lay hold upon the truth that through the grace of God, we can forget those things that are behind and lay hold of that which is ahead. Now, I'd now like to share a picture with you. I love this picture because it reminds me, I believe it's Jeremiah 18, a passage that has changed my life. I think it's Jeremiah. It could have been Isaiah. I'm not sure. I'm sorry I had it. He was instructed to go down to the house of the potter to see what was being made on the wheel of the potter. And as he observed, the vessel that was being made was marred. It was spoiled. It didn't work out the way it was supposed to. He watched and the vessel was spoiled in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel. 
He made it again. I love that. I have, I have found comfort, comfort and acceptance and life in that one verse. Because, friends, I have lived mindful of being marred, knowing that many things have worked out wonderfully and many things have not. And some of that is my own fault, and some of that is, is the circumstance and the fault of others. But what do you do in that situation? What do you do when things don't work out the way you wish they would have? What do you do when Abigail Joy Jackson passes away unexpectedly? Friends, is that not a marring? Is that not the spoiling of, a, of an instrument and a vessel? And friends, that next verse, so he made it again. So he began afresh. So he started anew. He continued putting his hand to what was there and bringing it forward into another vessel, another instrument. And I share that with all of us, friends, because I am confident that things in your life have not consistently worked out. And it is, it is very likely that some of those things haunt you to this day and bring discouragement and disheartenment and thereby limit you and narrow your activity and your engagement and, and your exercise unto purposefulness. So, hey, take heart with the potter's wheel. Take heart in general. Friends, the scriptures are rich. A reminder. Hear his voice. Christianity has lived in the public eye, but it originates and is sustained in private relationship with our living God. Now that is what I intended to share today. I would, I would take a few more minutes, if I may, and tell you about uh, uh, Acres for Joy, if I could. I'll go ahead and share that screen uh, with everyone. All right. Hey. Well, I, um, there is a website, and, and here's a representation of it. Uh, you're looking at just some of the activity on, on the website. Uh, Acres for Joy, my beloved daughter, Abby, passed away 15 years ago, and, and uh, I, I, I couldn't put together in words just the, the, what, what that brought my way. But in the midst of it, as I sought to understand why and how and, and how does this resolve and what's the purpose, and in the midst of it, and friends, I'm surrounded, I work in behavioral health, I'm surrounded by need all the time. And, uh, and we all are, we all, behavioral health or not. I mean, it's a difficult time. It's a difficult time to be a youth. And, and over the course of the years, we, we developed, um, we developed a, a, a ranch program, a ranch and equine assisted learning program. And five years ago, a number of us banded together and became a 501c3 with the intent to legitimize these kids' access to this property. And also with the intent to legitimize uh, those who want to support it and get behind it. And I, I would draw your attention, if you look at the website, uh, there's, uh, at, the, at, at the top, there's going to be a tab that says about us. And if you hit about us, there's a, there's a page there that says our beginnings. Friends, it took, me, it took me near 14 years to write that one page. I tried over and over and over. I tried to, to capture that. And, I, and by the grace of God, I was able to do that two years ago, right before the Eau Claire Kiwanis came and visited us, Kiwanis of Eau Claire. They came, they saw our program, they said, what can we do to help? And they subsequently donated $31,000. And, um, and we've, been, we've been using that and put this, putting this program together. Now, I just wanna share with you that we, right now we're serving over 60 kids a week, even in this COVID environment. To be in our program, you've gotta have challenges. To stay in our program, uh, to stay in our program, we got to see evidence of life, right? I mean, we just got to see that you want to you want to move forward, and um, and that's going very well. And we also work with the county, and we work with individuals in different levels of need. You know, reflected on here, that that wagon ride right there is just full of of youth with different challenges, and and our intent is to encourage them, to bless them to use these acres to enrich their lives. This is not a place where we really talk uh, much about um, what their difficulties are. I mean, if they bring that up, fine, but that's not our pursuit. Our pursuit, how about this? Acres for Joy, a place where horses and humans connect and help one another. A place where the activity of the moment displaces the pressure of the day and joy finds yet another opportunity. Now, Brent, do I have five minutes yet? 
Uh, you sure do. What what we'll do is uh, in the in the uh, next five minutes, of course, uh, Jeff can share, and then after that, we'll take questions and answers. So I see there's a couple questions coming into the chat box. Excellent. Uh, so uh, please write your questions in the chat box. We'll also give you an opportunity to unmute yourself and uh, allow yourself to ask your question directly to Jeff. But go ahead, Jeff. All right. So listen, uh, Acres for Joy is a place of wonder and excitement. And we engage kids. Our, our, our pillars are encourage, engage, and empower. And I want to share one, one example. I hope you come and see it. I, I, it's hanging on the wall. It's what I call the doors of opportunity. And, and the doors of opportunity. And behind the doors of opportunity are your dreams, your plans, your success. And the doors of opportunity, they swing on hinges like all doors, the hinges of attitude and respect and forgiveness and character, the hinges of attitude. I had kids yesterday chanting these four hinges, attitude, gratitude, respect, and self-motivation. And friends, what our program does is we underscore time and again, building in, building in these critical um, demeanors and dispositions and attitudes that you might have because your opportunities are so connected to how you relate to people and how you come across you know the importance of honesty I, I tell the kids if you come and work for me and get opportunity out here and you steal from me you're going to have opportunity but it's going to be different it's going to be different whereas if you are diligent and motivated and engaging your opportunities are continue to expand expand and span and so while we do do some horseback riding and we do do wagon rides with draft horses and we chase the goats and we pet the sheep and we grab eggs from the chickens, underpinning all of this is our desire that while we are alongside these developing hearts and minds, that we are encouraging and implanting within them value and character lessons. Um, and when opportunity, we are implanting faith as well now this this sign behind me right here i just had it made i picked it up yesterday for this for this but where is this going this is going in the clubhouse this is going down in the clubhouse where we serve youth because i'm going to tell this story you know in, in, in the in the wood shop we've got a sign that says life is all about plan b and and that's what i see in this passage so he made it again into another vessel and the kids that we serve friends they are coming from situations that are less than ideal. And the, the, the strong and steady message is that, is that it is not your circumstance that determines the outcome. You know, do we remember the quote that uh, Chuck Swindoll put forward? That the longer he lives, the more, the more he believes that life is 10% is of what happens to you and 90% of how you respond to it. And it's, it's laying hold upon our circumstance and, and, and using it. You know, I, I tell the kids this week and, and last week, it's less about what you have and don't have. And it's so much more about what you do with what you have, working from where you are. Now, friends, what is it? What is it that gets, what is it that gets a 19-year-old felon to end up spending 15 years of his life building a youth ranch, serving others and investing hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'll tell you what, the underpinning, it's the, the love of God. It's the grace of God. It's the value that God puts upon each one of us. And indeed, so many here are finding that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And, the, and I'll be honest with you, part of what has allowed me to lift my head after the passing of Abigail is that I've been able to help lift the heads and the hands and the hearts of others. And that's something we all have those opportunities for. So, well, there's my five minutes. And, uh, Appreciate that. Well, uh, Dan texts us and he says, love the saying, it all starts with our time with him. Uh, so maybe you could just make a quick comment on that, if you don't yeah. mind, Jeff. Yeah. Well, you know, I um, and I, I've I've been all over the spectrum on that, right? That that one organization that I was in for so many years, there was a lot about externals and a lot about going out. You know, uh, 
a lot of do, 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 do. And, and I, I was in that for a long time. And, and I want to say wonderful people. Um, and it was there I was greatly introduced to the scripture. But that can't be what sustains this. The sustenance is my hearing his, his calling my name and me knowing him and, and, and me reading the Bible. You know, I, the other thing I thought is, is that there's so much in the scripture we don't understand, right? And, and people go, well, I don't understand it. So then they distance themselves from it. And I want to turn that around and say, friends, let's not spend our time so much with what we don't understand. Let's spend our time with what we do understand. Let's begin. Let's begin with the passages we do know. And, and, and some of them are quite simple. And remember, we, we know this, that as Jesus spoke, the common people heard him gladly. The common people. And he can speak to us. His word can speak to us. And let the challenge be, in, in the New Testament, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are books that talk about his life. And if we don't know where to start, just start there. And, and, and don't get distracted by all we don't know underline in your Bible what you do know and what you do see. And I promise you, the Holy Spirit is near at hand to speak to you and to change you. That's a really good point, you know, and we can just say before we read, we can just say a prayer, God, you know, show me yourself Amen. through what I'm about Amen. to read. Give me something and, and he will be faithful in that. Joel has a question. Uh, for you, Jeff, what are the four hinges once again? Attitude oh, my gosh. Right? You know, I'll tell you what, five years ago, five years ago, I had I was going to have 12 kids in a summer school program for the first time. I knew that the administration was looking at me and I was going to talk about attitude. And I I didn't. And I was in this room, my my little study. I got on my knees and I said, Lord, I had Chuck Swindoll's quote. That was it. And I said, Lord, what what? And and I it came to me this thought of a hinge that attitude is the hinge that the door of opportunity opens on so that year i talked about attitude the next year i thought wait a minute it's not just attitude it's attitude and and relationship skills so that was that year this year i'm like wait a minute there's and i it was one door i had with two hinges this year i cut the door in half put put two doors and now i say there are many doors of opportunity and there are many hinges. There's the hinge of attitude. There's the hinge of respect. There's the hinge of honesty and character. These are all things. But the chant that these four kids did yesterday was, how about this? Attitude this is great. You guys are chanting this. I'm pointing at the board. It's attitude, gratitude, respect, and self-motivation. Huh? Attitude, gratitude, respect, and self-motivation. And I, I listen, embedded in this is please. Come and see me at Acres for Joy. I want to show you the doors of opportunity. I want to, I want to, we, we're, we're looking for those kind of lessons. This is going to be hanging on the wall. I've got a ship. There's a poem I found in prison. Absolutely changed my life. If you end up telling me you have three more minutes, I'll share it with you, but let's keep going. Other questions, you can go ahead and, and text those. Uh, Bob Menard says to everybody, have an attitude of gratitude. <laughs> It helps us when we're in the university of adversity. Oh, good word. Um, I was just in, uh, in a program where I had a biblical counselor and I faced three mountains last year. And uh, my biblical counselor had me write a list, a gratitude list for each one of those three challenges. Why I'm thankful for mm. mountain number one, mountain number two, mountain number three. And uh, when you pull out a blank sheet of paper and you actually write that gratitude list down, it really does change your attitude. He also taught me to say, thank you, God, for this opportunity to trust you. And he said, thank you, God, that this shows my great need for you. So you take those things that are challenges and you flip those around uh, into gratitude. So um, I don't see any coming in on the chat. Is there anybody who would like to just unmute and be on the recorded video and ask a question? If so, do, do it right now. And not seeing anybody, then we'll jump back to Jeff. All right. Well, listen, I was, uh, I was 19 years old. I was behind the wall in Lincoln, Nebraska. I was scared. I was lonely. I was bored. And I read and I found a poem. <laughs> I didn't read very much, but, you know, that's how I just, what do you do? You're, you're locked up in this room. And the, the poem is longer, right? And, but I'm going to, I'll just quote you the part that, that I've carried for all these years. One ship sails east and another sails west. 
with the self same winds that blow. Tis the set of the sail and not the gale that tells it the way to go. Like the winds of the sea are the winds of time, as, are the waves of time as we travel along through life. Tis the set of the soul that decides the goal and not the calm or the strife. And what I saw in that is that the, the very same wind blows one ship east and another west, the very same wind. And, and what determines which way it goes? It's the set of the sail. And friends, the wind in my life at that time was I was a 19 year old felon going behind, behind a wall. I had made horrible mistakes and I, I was very embarrassed. I was guilty. I was ashamed. My future, I, 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 I had no clarity, but I did catch a hint that there, I could conduct myself in such a way that I came back to prison over and over and over again. Or I could conduct myself in such a way that I used that same pressure, that same wind to take me a whole different direction. And obviously embedded in that is, is accessing the grace of God and the help of God and responding to that. And that's part of the message we share with these kids because kids increasingly are coming from complicated circumstances and, and the possibility of shipwreck is near at hand, but it doesn't have to be so, right? We can use our adversity, just like you shared. We can use our adversity and turn it around and to, to and, and obviously it's not just so quickly and easily done, but it begins by recognizing that it's even possible, that it's even possible that, that these negative things in my life don't, I mean, how, how can a, what, why, would a night, why would a guy say that going to prison was, the second best thing that ever happened to him. Well, friends, it, 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 it was traumatic. It was interruptive. And so, and, and I believe that these narrow places in all of our lives, that if, if we find the Lord's help within that place, that that becomes, that becomes a place of blessing and a place of new beginnings. And that, that bad things can turn good. Um, hey, there you go. That's the poem. If you come, it's gonna. It's hanging on the wall. I'd love to have you read it and show you the place. Appreciate that. And if you wouldn't mind, uh, as we wrap things up today, Jeff, would you please uh, have a prayer over us? Unless there's a, one more question from the field, I'll check the uh, chat box. I don't see anything there. Anybody else want to unmute and ask Jeff a question at this time? Okay. All right, Jeff. Well, if you wouldn't mind uh, just wrapping us up with a prayer and uh, sending those off, uh, all of us off uh, with uh, setting our sails in the right direction, that would be appreciated. Well, Lord, again today, we, we lift our hearts to thank you. We're mindful of your goodness that surrounds us and of the help that we've known in so, so many ways. Lord, we pray that you'd help us, each of us, in our own unique and specific circumstance to find forgiveness, redemption, release, pardon, and praise. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to find purpose and to make a difference and to use our lives, our circumstance, amongst our community. And Lord, we need your help. Speak to us individually. Give us that boldness and confidence that comes with hearing your voice and knowing your way. Lord, we look to heaven. We look to you. We're grateful. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, Jeff, uh, in behalf of all of us here listening and on in, in, in uh, both virtually and on the YouTube channel, we thank you for joining us and uh, we appreciate you very much. Uh, join us next month with our, our next uh, video, uh, our next online experience here with Leading with Power. In behalf of all of us, thanks for joining us. God bless you and be well. Goodbye.